of our spirits together. And as we meet tomorrow especially and talk about evangelism in the local church, I pray that you'll be able to attend, and if there are others, that you might invite them to come along as well. And then, of course, God willing, if the Lord spares us on Sunday. The verse that I want to um, underscore this evening is found in 1 Timothy in chapter 1. And uh, Pastor Brenton asked that I share something of what God is doing in uh, uh, South Africa and Canada where I am. And uh, by way of a testimony tonight, I thought I would share this particular verse that I can give thanks to the Lord for as I stand before you. 1 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. It's a great verse that. And uh, it's a verse that we can apply uh, to our own hearts and lives, I'm sure. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Master, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, what a verse, and especially if you and I sense that God has given us a ministry. In fact, every one of us, when we come into his family, we are part of a great ministry. We have a particular ministry, and it will vary uh, from person to person. The moment we part of the body, uh, we are members of that body. We might be that finger, that finger, that nose, that ear, and so we can go on. Everyone forms the part of the body and therefore has a ministry. The ministry that God gives is not because of us, it's because of him. Not because we deserve it, but because of his grace. The ministry that God gives varies from person to person. And the Holy Spirit in all his power comes and makes himself known through the different parts of the body and it's called gifted forms of ministry. The word for ministry is connected closely to it is the whole concept of being a servant. And the idea of a servant speaks of humility. The idea of a servant speaks of serving. You cannot be a servant if you don't serve. And so we are all servants together. And none of us is better than another. It's level, the ground. Our job is to do what he asks us to do. You have a world that I do not have. And I live in a world that you do not have. I'm asked to be a servant in my world. Whatever that means and I don't know it all, God knows it all, but as one gets older you begin to discover the world that he's put us into. And not only gives, is there the connotation of servanthood, but there's also the, the connotation of me as an individual using my gifts, and that is stewardship. If I do not use my gifts, I will lose my gifts. And uh, unfortunately, there are many that have not recognized their gifts. And that's what the church is there for, really, to help each one to recognize and discover exactly what their gifts are. And as we discover what our gifts are, we learn that they are there to be used. And we are to be good stewards of whatever God has given to us. I was reading a little article uh, today that I thought I would share with you before I get into the talk, and it says these words, and maybe we can uh, just listen to it carefully. If you have food to eat, clothes,
clothes on your back and a roof over your head, you are richer than 75% of the whole world. That's something for a good Baptist to say amen to. Okay? If you have money in the bank, your wallet and spare change in a dish someplace, you are, are in the top 8% of the world's wealthy. So you're all wealthy people here, by the way, uh, this evening. Is that right? If you awoke this morning with more than health than illness, you are blessed than a million who won't survive this week. A million people. Eh? If you've never experienced the danger of battle, the agony of torture, the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of five hundred million people in the world. That's a lot of people. And we ought to bow our heads in gratitude to God for the freedom that we have and enjoy. If you can attend a church meeting without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are, you are more blessed than three billion people in the world. Three billion Blows your mind, doesn't it? If your parents are still alive and, and still married, you are very rare. That's talking to young people. Uh, if you can hold someone's hand, hug them or touch them on the shoulder, you are blessed because you can offer a healing touch. If you read this message, you have a double blessing because you were being thought of. And furthermore, you are blessed more than two billion people that cannot read at all. And so we can go on and on and count our blessings and stop complaining and just recognize how God is so good to us wherever we are, in the, where we live here in this beautiful city of Adelaide in this wonderful country of Australia and in other parts of the free world wherever God has put us. And uh, I'm here tonight to bear testimony of God's grace that because of his mercy uh, he has counted me worthy of being in the ministry and to seek in one way or another and as Paul said that by all means I may win some and our job in this world is to be a living testimony of God's grace and mercy. And so I want to start this evening by um, just sharing my testimony, the way the Lord has led and guided in counting me worthy of the ministry. And I underline again, only because of his grace. If it was any other way, I wouldn't be here. But it's all of his grace. And then to share some of the things that uh, we have witnessed and seen, uh, both in South Africa and in Canada. I am living at the moment in Canada. We moved there nearly four years ago after being the rest of our lives in South Africa. I have three daughters. Two of them live here in Canada, in Perth, in Australia, in Perth. The other, my oldest daughter, lives in Canada. At the time, the two that were here didn't have citizenship. So they said, uh, you, we can't help you to come in as a sponsored parent, but our eldest daughter did, and she said, come and die here in Canada. So we've gone there to get ready uh, to go to heaven from there if the Lord doesn't come. Um, we, we moved out of South Africa in steaming hot weather and landed slap in the winter of Canada. We joined the frozen chosen. And <laughs> have experienced something of what real cold is all about. I've been more cold here in Australia than Canada, simply because there they know how to take care of the cold. In South Africa and here, we, we just kind of stick it out. But there, you, you're hot inside, now we'd all have our jackets off and so on, and you make a beeline for the car, and the cars are warmed up, get home, into the garage, and... Um, 
into your home where it's warm again. So Canada caters very well. When you go into the shopping malls, you take off your jacket, otherwise it gets too hot and so on. Uh, but it's taken a while to get used to the snow and everything else that one has there. We left just over two weeks ago, and we had a snowstorm and a hailstorm, one of the worst they've had for many years. On that weekend, it started on the Saturday, that Sunday was the worst. We had to cancel all services, no church, and uh, everything was closed. And yet people traveled, and there were 400 accidents just in Toronto. People, you put your hand, foot on the brake, ladies and gentlemen, you skid and you go everywhere. It's a horrible feeling, as you might know, uh, when you find you have no control whatsoever. So, you know, by the grace of God, we survived all that. And uh, we have a ministry that I'll share about that God has entrusted to us, uh, which is quite exciting and challenging there in Toronto, uh, which is uh, quickly becoming one of the main crossroads of the world. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. But I was reared in, a, in South Africa, and um, my parents were missionaries or evangelists. Our home was a home where God was honored, respected. Uh, my father set the pace and uh, went all over preaching and worked very much amongst the African people in South Africa, down in the coastal areas, and uh, was, of course, a, a great inspiration to us. One of the things that I will certainly never forget is that every morning at 6.30, it was prayer time. And then there was breakfast. If you couldn't make it to the prayer time, you couldn't have breakfast. And 7.30, you had to leave for, for school. And so every morning at 6.30, the family had to gather. We had to have a song. Someone had to read the scripture. Another one had to pray, another one had to give a little story, and we would, or another one would lead us in prayer. That was the ritual, if I can use the word, every morning. And I can still remember those occasions. Now, that's nearly hundreds of, hundreds of years ago now, you know. It's a long time ago. But those little things have stuck. And I can remember I was the age of 13. And my father was away. My mother had prayed. And I was overwhelmed with a sense of need that I was not going to heaven. I was really in a Christian home. We knew all the songs, all the verses. We could quote it and everything else. But I didn't have the assurance deep in my heart that I was a child of God. And while others went for breakfast, I knelt there at my mother's knee and said, Mom, you've got to pray with me. I want to receive the Lord Jesus. And I remember it. And prayed that prayer and rose a person that was sure of eternal life. Uh, it's amazing how those things stick. And uh, we thank God for families and family prayers, family devotions, godly emphasis, and yet the need for one to still come to faith in Christ. I have a twin brother. He's my elder brother. He's 25 minutes older than me. He's the authorized version. I'm the revised standard version. <laughs> and he's also an evangelist. He's preaching down in America somewhere tonight. And uh, they live still in South Africa. And he got converted shortly after that at a camp. And it wasn't long when at 14 years of age, we began to feel that God was calling us into the ministry. And we studied the preachers. And we checked the way they preached, and we made the notes, and we came home and prepared our sermons, and felt that one day we were going to be the Billy Grahams of the world, you know, <laughs> and so on, and just had a burning passion to want to spread the gospel. And I remember at 15, we went to three of us, there another friend of ours as well, same situation, uh, we hitchhiked several hundred miles away, it was our holiday time, to a friend, lived in a country town, at a farm, and we went and spent 10 days on the farm with him. And he was a lovely brother and loved the Lord. 
and had a burden for the farming area and the little town and so on. And so we decided that we were going to hire the town hall and have an evangelistic rally. And the teenagers would preach the message. And we made big posters, invited everybody to come. In those days, the little village man, anything that was on, people came to. And uh, we packed the place out that Friday night. I'll never forget it. And uh, we stood up there, man. We couldn't sing for toffee. We sang the place down. We sang a quartet, the four or three or three or four of us. And then we got up and preached, man. And suddenly the Spirit of God just descended on the place, man. Gave an invitation. The people came forward weeping, absolutely broken before the Lord. We felt it was like a touch of revival. And God just moved right in and did an amazing work right there in the hearts of people and changed lives. And you know, when that happened, we said, man, it doesn't matter what else lies ahead. We want to be out there on the battlefront preaching the gospel. And since then, uh, by God's grace, uh, God led and opened the doors, and began to preach, and share the gospel. And go. when we left school, we worked for a while, and then went to study at the theological seminary in Johannesburg, and then into the ministry. God called us into church planting, first of all, and then into evangelism. I was the national youth director for the whole of South Africa, and taking youth teams all over and across the borders to do evangelism. And then God called us to a larger church where we developed a whole program of outreach and God was good to us. And then I was invited to become the director for Southern Africa for an organization out of the States called Evangelism Explosion, which is a ministry there. I don't know if you heard of it, brother, by Dr. James Kennedy. And it was a huge program of um, evangelism training pastors to train their people. And uh, its headquarters were there in uh, Fort Lauderdale in the Presbyterian Church, a tremendous church, and from there into every nation of the world, uh, these training schools were set up. And my job was to develop it not only in South Africa, but into about 12 or 15 of the African states, and to translate it into the languages and to make it applicable in the the situations among the ethnic groups and so on, and to mobilize churches into evangelism so that every week there would be teams going out being witnesses for the Lord Jesus. And it was an exciting time, uh, especially uh, amongst, first of all, the African people who took to it very much in, in the rural areas, in learning how to share their faith just by using their fingers and so on. And um, then to get into some of the large uh, de- traditional churches in South Africa and to train pastors who'd been through seven years of theological seminary and yet not knowing how to share the gospel and to get them to train their people. Uh, it was a, r- a remarkable experience. And then we were able to get into the theological schools and teach in the schools uh, evangelism and outreach. And I, I, God w- was good, and I was there for about 12 years in this training ministry. And then God began to lead us, my wife and myself, into a wider ministry of not, not only training, but also being involved in evangelistic work. And so we started a ministry called uh, Multi Ministries. And it had five main thrusts. One was evangelism and outreach. One was training for evangelism. The other was media uh, in developing TV, uh, radio, and literature. The other was in, into um, helping churches, especially in the rural areas of building and some practical work. And the other was running conferences. And we developed a team of 20 folks that were with us, evangelists and workers, that were involved in one way or other in these areas. And uh, for nearly 25 years, uh, God gave us that privilege of seeing this spread all over uh, Southern Africa. And uh, every we'd bring teams over. So Carl Comedy, you all know him. He'd bring teams from Australia. We'd have teams that would come from uh, uh, elsewhere in America, Canada, Uh, Northern Ireland and so on, and to deploy them into strategic areas where they could be involved in evangelism right there amongst the people. That newspaper uh, challenge 
became one of our greatest weapons uh, for evangelism. And uh, still it's going well there. And uh, we thank the Lord for the vision that God gave to Brother Carl. And uh, I'll be talking a bit about it, especially later and tomorrow, how it can be a wonderful tool if it's not already uh, in your church and wherever you are. Um, then we prayed, you know, as we were facing now, you know, latter years, one felt uh, we wanted the work to go forward, and so we needed to get a successor. And uh, so we prayed, and then after several trials and er errors and so on, God brought a young couple, and they've taken the work, and we see it still going ahead, and we're grateful to God for it. And then God brought us across to uh, Canada, and when I got there, um, a friend of mine who worked with the North American Mission Board, which is a, more of the uh, um, work of the Southern Baptists from America, said we're doing a lot of church planting in Canada and especially around Toronto. And we would like, if possible, for you to be involved in helping us uh, in these church plants. And so they gave us an invitation to come in mainly as a mentor to many of these pastors. <clears throat> and uh, to date, you know, Canada, at least Toronto, has 7 million people. And of the 7 million, there's a good 4.5 million that are totally ethnic groups. And so when I say it's the crossroads of the world, you've got them there, everyone you can think of. And this has just created great opportunities for sharing the gospel. Uh, God's bringing the Egyptians right there, the, the um, folks from Africa right there, the uh, Syrians right there, and uh, to work with them. Uh, many of them come there not knowing what's, what's going to happen, what's going to be the future, what to believe in, is there a God, is, it, does Islam really work, and so on. And our job is to try and train pastors amongst them to reach them with the gospel. And I'll share a bit about that in the moment. But when I go back uh, to South Africa, um, I want to share that it's a country at the moment that certainly deserves our prayers. It's a country that's going through some horrific experiences. There's one farmer a week that's getting killed and uh, some horrible experiences and friends we've known. And, and there's an area that we used to minister, and my one daughter used to stay there. And they, every week there's someone who's killed, and they say, he'll be next, he'll be next. And it's just rough. And so there's bitterness and hatred and justice and injustice and racialism in reverse and all sorts of things that are going on. It's a country that has come through its ups and its downs. And maybe uh, there is a time of uh, retribution that's going on with many that are paying the price for actions in the past. But two wrongs don't make a, r a right. And not only the whites, but the blacks. Oh, there's too much killing. I, I get a little thing every day of what's going on. And um, violence and corruption in high places is the order of the day. And so many are leaving, as you know, but many are staying, and our prayers are certainly with them. And uh, in spite of all that, uh, God has been at work. And sometimes when it is rough, uh, people turn to God very easily. Uh, I don't know if you remember some years ago in one of our churches there, it was called the St. James Church down in Cape Town, while the service was in progress. From the two side doors, they rushed in with hand grenades filled with nails and they flung them up the aisles of 1,800 people that had gathered that Sunday night, and they blew up and killed 13, and 65 were injured, and it was a horrific attack, and, and out of that, over, at the funeral service, over 200 people came to faith in Christ, so sometimes God can turn the tragedy. Uh, sitting right in the front here, in this huge church, was a, a Russian 
Russian sailors from a Russian trawler ship that was going to the south, towards the South Pole. And they would, they would dock in Cape Town for three weeks in preparing themselves to go down south. And this church had a vision. They'd send a busload, pick them up, bring them to church, enjoy the service. Halfway through, they'd all move out and they'd go to an, another room and the Russian would interpret a gospel message for them. Many of them came to faith in Christ. And um, some of the first to be shot were those sitting in the front there. And one of the ladies who we trained in evangelism was sitting with her husband and just before the service started, she said, let me go and sit with him so I can show them what to do. She sat there. This guy came in. She was number one who was shot. And, in, and, and others. Anyway, the Russian, the captain of the ship uh, stood up in that congregation and uh, he... Uh, he said, friends, thank you for what you do for us. You know, he was as raw to the gospel as possible because they loved these people and helped them. They stayed there for nearly three months. And the night before they left, he said, last time I stood here, I said, friends, now I call you brothers. And there was a beautiful unity amongst them in the midst of pain and tragedy. And one of the men, I'm sure you've heard about Angus Buchan. How many, how many heard about Angus Buchan? I'm sure you all heard. God has just raised him up. He's a great guy. He's a friend of mine. Know him well. In many of our outreaches, he used to join us and so on. And a man that God has laid his hand on. From a theological perspective, brother, he has had no training. He's had training from a higher source. And God has used him in a remarkable way, in a man of faith. He's got his critics, like everybody has his critics. But he's a God-honoring man. Let me tell you some of the stories of Brother Angus Buchan. You might have heard some of them, but he is an inspiration, and we thank God for what he's done. He has a farm in KwaZulu-Natal, and on that farm he has a place for all, it's got an orphanage, and uh, that's where he came to faith in Christ. If you've seen the film Faith Like Potatoes and so on, and God has used him in that farm to spread the gospel all over. And he travels today all around the world. And he's been here, as I know, many times. Uh, he began with a burden for men. And he called, his first conference was called God, um, God's Mighty Men. And there were about 60 to 100 people that came. Next year, it moved to 200. It then jumped to 2,000. And on and on at 60,000. You know that the last one that he had was 400,000 men that gathered for that conference. Can you imagine 400,000? They flew in from Cape Town with, with uh, jumbo jets to land, not, not on the farm, but near, in Durban, to be able to go to the conference. People came from Australia, from, from uh, South America, and from Europe as well to be at the conference. It's just a weekend. Eh? And they kicked off on the Friday. On the roads that led to the farm, the highways, there was, when you came to the toll roads, there was a special entrance on the toll gate for those going to the conference, and they went through free. Everything was arranged to get people to hear the gospel. And not all were Christians, but it was a great thing for the men to come. And on the Saturday morning, he was busy preaching, and as he completed the message, he had a heart attack. And the doctors that were there were calling, and they said, if we don't get this man to the hospital as soon as possible, he's going to die. There's no doubt about it. This is a heavy heart attack. They flew in a helicopter, landed right there. And as he got into that helicopter, he waved. He could hardly move. He said, I'll be back. Don't worry. I'll be back. And they took him to Peter Maritzburg. And when they landed at Peter Maritzburg and checked him out, his heart was perfect. He said, God touched him in flight to Peter Maritzburg. That night, when the news came back that he had gone, got to all the men at the, at the conference, that he'd had a heart attack, 20,000 got up and left. Because they'd come to hear Angus and not God. God just cleansed the place. And Sunday morning he was back 
and he preached the final message with no problem whatsoever as far as the heart was concerned. And God did some miracles in that particular conference, some amazing conversions of folks that came to Christ. One was a big boy on, on, on the motorbike world, and they'd come with their motorbikes and so on, and he was a rough, tough, hard character, cruel as you could make him, and he got gloriously saved. His wife didn't know him when he got home. She couldn't believe that this was the same man. God had met him, changed his life completely. And uh, just a few weeks later, on that motorbike, accident, dead, straight to heaven. God had just changed his life in time. There was a, a terrorist organization, of the terrorist organization, uh, folks who'd infiltrated the conference, had an experience with God, and there was a picture of him and those that he hated with arms around one another in faith to the Lord. That's a miracle. God has used this man uh, to speak to the nation like few other men. I watched the other night when he addressed Parliament. And in, in Cape Town, where our Parliament sits, there is an adjacent hall as well for other meetings. And so they had the meeting in that hall for all who would like to come. It was not compulsory, but they invited everyone from Parliament to come. And a major section of, parla of the parliamentarians came to hear him preach. And he stood up there, and what was his main message? His main message was, if we want to save South Africa, we've got to move to a spirit of repentance and then reconciliation. You see, everyone is fighting for survival, the picture is bigger than just survival. It's revival. And there's a big difference between the two. So before he spoke at that conference, he arranged a huge one-day conference in the center of South Africa for over a million people that he invited to come to, the con to that one-day conference. And that conference had to be for repentance and reconciliation. Over a million. Some said it was two million, but we reckon about 12 to 15. 1.2, 1.5 million came from all over South Africa for that one day. And they had it on a farm. And he said, there's going to be no special things. There's going to be no catering, no teas and coffees, nothing. You bring your own. Not many facilities. And the farmer said to him, you know, you can have the property, but one of the problems we've got is no water. You've got to have toilets, you know, and so on for such a crowd. What are we going to do? He said, there's no water. So he said, well, let's trust God. <laughs> so he said, on the Thursday night before the conference, he said, let's drill for water. And I remember watching on television them drilling. And they brought the big drilling thing down. They went, man, they went down. They waited and waited as they prayed before God. And suddenly there was a burst of water 20 feet up into the sky as it flooded the area. And they just brought everything they needed to have enough water for that particular day's conference. How do you explain that? God. God can do anything. He can control water. He can show people what to do. And as he preached, uh, there was a, a, a mighty move. Now, some have imagined, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say for vouch for it, but they said there was a cloud that moved over the whole area as he preached. Now, whether that's so, I don't know. But there was a spirit of repentance and turning to God. And he prayed a prayer at the end. And, you, you know, to hear over a million people repenting before God for their sins as a nation, it's a big thing, man. I mean, if that's not revival, what is revival? And uh, we are extremely grateful for what, how God has used uh, this man. And one of the problems that we've had in South Africa is Cape Town, which has had no rain. Now, Cape Town gets its rain every June, July, August. Since July last year, they had no rain whatsoever. And by April... It was so bad, the, the reservoirs were empty. They said, by the 19th of April or whatever it was, the taps will be turned off. There will be no water. 
You must make your own plans. Now, this, this, can, this is a recipe for disaster. And um, the believers prayed. The, first of all, they, they said, on a certain Wednesday, early in April, they asked everyone to take 10 minutes off at work to ask God for rain. And they reckon 5 million people took those 10 minutes to pray for rain. And rain came not there, but in some catchment area, and farmers who had reservoirs opened up, and so the date was extended to the 5th of May till now. In the meantime, in the uh, end of April, yeah, I watched uh, Angus. He announced to have a rally at a huge stadium in Cape Town. He invited everyone to come, and he said, bring your umbrellas, by the way, bring your soap because you're going to have lots of rain. And 60,000 people came into this stadium, packed it out. And he began to preach. And I, I watched the thing on television, and um, uh, some of the members of parliament, front rows, all sitting there. Provincial leaders were sitting there. One of the problems in the townships there is, is, is gang warfare. And here were all the gang leaders sitting all over the place, man. And as he began to preach and call them to repentance, the rain began to fall. And they put up the umbrellas just as God had predicted. It was an amazing sight. I mean, and you've got to understand that people were desperate to bring umbrellas when we know we've had no rain and it's finished. So bring the umbrellas. <laughs> and just light rain began to fall as if God was saying, don't worry, boys and girls, I'm still in charge. He gave an invitation. He said, Son, will you need to come here and kneel and get right? And there are gang leaders sitting here. You can't have a country and a nation and a city where gangs are killing one another. I'm asking you to come and stand here, and I want to grip your hand, and I'm going to ask God to forgive you and for you to change. And 12 gang leaders stood up. And he walked to the first one, and he took his big black hat. And he took it and put it on his head. And he gave it to him. And he prayed and that guy just knelt. He took his Bible and gave it to the next guy. He took his shirt off and gave it to the next fella. He took his boots off and gave it. He almost had nothing more to give. And he had them all kneeling there. Repenting before God. More than just the rain is to see wicked, cruel, horrific Men and women caught up in gangsterism, repenting and coming to faith in Christ. Two weeks ago, before I left, they, or was it last weekend, there was so much rain that it became now a danger point. And God in his own way has just stepped in. Takes you back to the days of old Elijah a little bit, you know, when God, when God touched Elijah and he called the nations to come. And prove the God who answers by fire. I'll never forget him preaching one day at a rugby stadium in Pretoria for men. It was the largest crowd they've ever had because not only were the stands full, there were 70,000 there, but also the fields were full of people. And Angus preached that day and he preached like a prophet against sin. And amongst the other sins, he said, you young guys sitting here, you're living together and you're not married. He said, I want you to know it's sin. And you'll never have the blessing of God upon you until you repent. I want to ask you to stand if you're guilty, if you're one of these. And I want you to say before God you're going back to either get married right away or to move out and get ready for marriage. And all over that stadium, Men stood up unashamed before God as they repented of this. When God touches hearts of men in that situation, that's a move of the Spirit. Eh? And one can go on and on and speak of how God has used one man. Of course, they've criticized him. and They went on television in some religious program. They criticized him because he's a showman, they say, and so on. Well, whatever it is, he brings honor and glory to God. 
He preaches repentance of sin. He does not cover up for that. And he calls people to honor the Lord Jesus and go back into their church. And this, this has been a great encouragement uh, to us who look on uh, to South Africa. And, of course, look beyond a man. Of course, if you, if, as I said earlier, when 20,000 move off from a big conference like that, the eyes were on the wrong person. And that happens. And you'd always have that. The Lord Jesus had those. You went with him, and the minute he laid down the cost of discipleship, a whole lot of them left. He said, yeah, they came just for the food and didn't come to, fo- to be a follower. And um, so, you know, when you look at that, you say, well, there's hope. Because God is still in control. From a human point of view, there's corruption and all sorts of crime going on, but God is in control. And so in all your many prayers, I want to encourage you uh, to keep on praying uh, for South Africa, as it is obviously, for from the point of view of Africa, a key nation as a springboard into the rest of Africa. And we praise the Lord for that. When, when we move to Canada, as I said... Uh, God enabled us to work with many of these young men and their wives in planting churches. Now, we weren't waving a wand at all over Toronto. As I said, there's seven million. It's a huge city. It's the fourth largest city in North North America. Um, But our job was just to get alongside these uh, young pastors. Some of them have done exceptionally well. One guy's come there, and within five years, he's been there now four years, he'll get easy 120 people already to the church. And 80% are all converts that have come to faith in Christ. He's just gone door to door, just gone door to door, that's all. And God's opened doors, and people have come to faith in Christ. And there are others who get two or three, and they just keep on. And so, you know, God is not the God of numbers like we are. We only measure success by big numbers. Nickels and noses, somebody said. Uh, That's not really success. It's that stickability and keep on keeping on that really counts. And so my wife and I try every week not only to be in touch on the telephone, but to meet with these pastors, to pray with them, to visit them in their home or to make an appointment, to meet them and then minister every Sunday in different church and try and encourage them. (coughs) (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let me share some of the things that uh, some of them are doing uh, to establish their churches. You know, you, when the Lord says, go into the highways and byways, that sometimes means that's where you've got to go to catch the fish uh, where they are. And one, one, one group has an interesting uh, development, and something similar to what you're doing tomorrow, tomorrow night. They hire a restaurant every Sunday morning. Restaurant opens at 11.30. They've asked for the restaurant from 9 o'clock to 10.30. And they, everybody comes and they have the service. And then they offer a free dinner, a lunch, for anyone who stayed and they pay the restaurant for them. So that if there's 15 that are there, for the, they pay the restaurant. They don't pay for the use of the premises, but they pay the restaurant for 15 people enjoying a Sunday lunch. If it's 30, then it starts getting expensive. But that's, that's another problem they face. But what do they do? They work during the week, these two young fellas. And they paint houses and they advertise and so on, getting the income, and they're visiting, 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 and at, in, inviting people to church on a Sunday at this particular well-known restaurant uh, in a place called Milton, which is not far from where we live. And as a result, they say, if we go downtown and we hire a hall, it's going to cost us up to $800 a month. He said, we won't hire a hall, we'd rather pay for the meal and get people there and share the gospel. And just in in the last few, they've been going probably four months now, and they're getting 15 people already. Of course, the restaurant free, free meal does attract them, but they're hearing the gospel. And... uh it's a unique way as far as that is concerned. There's, a, there's another church that has a, what we call a beer ministry. And that sounds terrible, to have a beer ministry. What happens in the town, there are scores of what we call hobos, tramps, in the town, just living to drink. 
And they know that if they can collect beer bottles, empty beer bottles, and bring them to the municipality or a certain place there, they'll be paid 10 cents, 20 cents for a beer bottle. And so they collect all weekend beer bottles and they line up Monday morning to hand the beer bottles in. And they stand there for an hour before they go in. And the church just goes along with coffee and something to eat and has a, it gives them something to read. And I've tried to encourage them to use the challenge newspaper. And while they're standing there to give their beer bottles in, they're getting the gospel and they're hearing, having actual little service. Now that's unique to them. Only eternity will result. But what's the church doing? Going to where the fish are. And um, I think there's something in it they ought to be commended. There's another crowd that have um, a bicycle ministry. And they have a bicycle shop, and all week they're fixing bikes. People are riding a lot of bikes in that area, Hamilton. And uh, on a Friday night, everybody's invited to a meal at the bicycle shop. The place is cleared out. And they have a meal laid on. Everybody comes and they sing. Someone gives a message and folks are challenged with the gospel. And they've built up a whole, must be 34 folks there already. 30 to 40 people are preached there. Some time ago we had five or six folks raise their hands to respond to the gospel. And just the bike people. On Sunday they're all out riding their bikes. You see, they're not interested. So they don't go to church. Their church is Friday night. And um, what do you do? They'll, you'll never get them into a, an ordinary, traditional church. And uh, these are contacts that they make uh, throughout the week, which uh, one is thrilled uh, to see it. I was um, invited, uh, you know, one of the areas, of course, of ministry or opportunities amongst the Muslims. And many of the Muslims come from Syria and those areas, and they come there thoroughly disillusioned with the Muslim teaching, because all they're seeing is slaughter, terrible, horrific things that are going on. Remember one pastor, they came into the village, they took him, they took his 14-year-old boy and they tied them up. And they said to him, denounce your faith and your boy will go free. If you do not, we will behead him in front of you. They asked him, will you denounce your faith? They said, no. He said, we will, we will cut his head off in front of you. And he looked at his boy. His boy said, no. And they cut his head right off in front of him. I mean, I'd rather give myself to be, have it than my son or my grandson. And, you know, they've, they come the absolutely fractured in their minds about any hope whatsoever. And they look to the West they say, what has the West got to offer us? Is there anything in your religion which is different from our religion? And our job is to meet these people in their desperation. They have nothing. They can't even speak English. They have very, the government gives them just a paltry amount to try and survive. And they need to get jobs. They need to try and learn English and try to get acceptance. And right there to be able to show them the love which earns you the right to share the gospel. You can't share the gospel until you've shown them love and you've built into their lives and clothed them. And uh, as a result, uh, the Muslim force or factor is a big challenge to us today. And I work with several of the Pakistani pastors and many of them have escaped with their lives. And they show me a picture on the wall of their brother who was killed and so on. And, and uh, they just have a tough time. And they've escaped. And they're now trying to make a living there in Toronto. Last year, in December, this one little pastor from, from Pakistan and his wife, lovely couple, and their two daughters, have settled into a town. And they decided to have a Christmas banquet for all the Muslims and all the Sikhs and all the Buddhists and everybody else uh, to come for this banquet for Christmas. And as a result, they packed it out. There were 150 of them. There was the imam from the Muslims there. 
and uh, Hindus were there, and they brought greetings and everything. That was a big social effect. And then his, he, he brought in some who sang the gospel, and then they said, and now we're going to have Harold Peasley to come and speak to us about Christmas. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how in the world do you tell this bunch who are not interested, they've come for the food, there's no doubt about it, because there was a massive meal laid on. And it was freezing cold, but they kept on coming. They packed the place out. And I thought, well, Pakistanis, we've got something in common. If you're South African, and you know what it is, of course, cricket. <laughs> I said, man, cricket is the game that we all play. How many of you guys will play cricket? Yeah, they all raise their heads. Yes, we play cricket. How many knows? And I've got some names of some of the Pakistani cricket players and call the names out there, recognize them like that, man. And I said, well, how does cricket work? And I said, you know what it is? You've got a batsman standing there, man. You've got a bowler out there, and that bowler is bent on catching you out. Whether he gets your wicket or gets you caught or stumped or run out, he does everything in his power to catch you out in life, and you're out. And I said, that happens in life, doesn't it? We get caught out on every time we make mistakes and we caught out because we've got an enemy, an opposition that wants to try and break us down. And I said, you know, that's what Christmas is all about. When this whole world was bowled out and there was no more hope, that God decided to come and take our place and handle that bowler which you and I couldn't handle. And his name is Jesus and what you have to do is learn that Jesus wants to come and live in your heart and become your savior and enable you to be able to handle the bowl, the balls that these bowlers bowl in life and you can come through and hit him for a six. And you know, you could get, you could just sense there was a response amongst them and so on. And I said, now, how many of you tonight would like to receive this Jesus into your heart and face Christmas in the right way, man? And 15 raised their hands like that as we pray to receive Christ. Now, what is that? Not me being clever. Never on your life. Just the Holy Spirit just directed something that meant something to them that they could grasp and see who Jesus is who can come and be my Savior where I am in life. And... Uh, uh, you know, that little old pastor was so thrilled, man, to see a response like that. He, he only gets 15, 20 to his service. And um, he now, of course, was busy with the follow-up. We're going to do another men's, conference, men's breakfast for him and another one at the end of the year. And uh, if that's the way to reach them, praise the Lord. Uh, there are different ways. Uh, many, it's one-on-one, -on -one, just as the Lord opens the door. And so, you know, my wife and I, we're on now, I'm 74, you know, and um, we say, well, what else does God want us to do? Uh, 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 simply to be available to help these dear ones in their work. Um, I deal with a little Mexican guy and his wife, and she's got the type of leukemia, and they're battling, man. And yet he's, he's, he's already thinking of starting a second church, and he's only got 22 coming to service. And we challenge them, within five years, you must start another church uh, so that you can learn to multiply and uh, of the 53, only two have church buildings. Everyone else just hires a place wherever they can get in. I work with a lot of Filipinos once a month, and they um, have a little restaurant they clear, clear out. They run it all week. It's the only in the shopping mall. And then on a Sunday, we have the service there for them. And um, lovely, lovely people. So, you know, that's where we are at the moment. And to say that we, we're... Uh, excited is putting it mildly uh, because this is not our work. It's God's work, eh? Amen. Amen. And if it's God's work, he's got lots in store for us. And so I want you to feel encouraged. Uh, even tonight and tomorrow as we share a little bit. And on Sunday, uh, you know, God can stretch us. Eh? He can stretch us beyond our comfort zones and say, why has God put us here to decorate the street? What purpose is there? He's got plans. And he wants to be involved in and through what we are seeking to do. He's a big God, man. He's a great God. He'll never let us down. And uh, he's, the Lord Jesus said, it's my church, not, not your church, it's my church. And 
the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so I want you to feel encouraged. Have a little booklet at the back there if you're interested, The Heartbeat of Evangelism. Going to be talking a lot out of that tomorrow, and there's some amazing stories in there. If you want to get one, please take one. If you want to put a donation down, you're welcome, but that doesn't really matter. And um, if that can help you in your own little world, wherever you are, uh, just to be uh, influenced for God. I flew down yesterday, and I said to my wife, try and get me an aisle seat, because I don't like sitting in the middle of a three-and-a-half-hour flight. And they couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And I got to the airport and they said, yeah, you sit in the middle. I said, no, man, I wanted an aisle seat. They said, sit in the middle. (laughs) So (laughs) sat in the middle. And um, the guy on the aisle, he was a dead duck, never opened his mouth and sat in there. I said, get no response out of him. Other fellow was nice. And after a while we got talking and suddenly this guy opened up. He's in charge of a big business here. And they asked me what conference I was at. He'd been up there, and I said, I'm going to a conference in Adelaide. What's it about? I said, well, as a matter of fact, it's, um, it's a church conference. He said, oh, I said, what church? I said, he said, it's Roman Catholic. I said, no, no, it's a Baptist. I said, what church do you go? He said, oh, Anglican. Don't go much, you know. I had to talk. To I said, you'd be interested to know what I'm going to be talking about at the conference. And he said, yeah, what are you going to talk about? I said, about how we can go to heaven. He said, as a matter of fact, have you ever thought about that? He said, no, he said, my, my father died. I said, where did he go? He said, I don't know. I said, but you know, that's what the conference is about. We can know that if we die, we'll go to heaven. Would you like to know how one can be sure? And we sat for half an hour talking about faith in the Lord Jesus and that Jesus alone can give. And then he said, you know, it's very interesting you talk like this. A, my accountant always talks like this to us. I said, there you are. Now, you know how God's working with you. He said, yeah, but they rag him and they pull him to pieces. He doesn't care. He just goes on witnessing for the Lord and so on. I said, well, he has another angle. You go and tell him I've spoken to you. Unfortunately, I had some tracks with me. And I said, now, listen, you're going to die. There is no doubt about it. We're all going to die. And I said, if you're ever faced with that, I want to tell you how, what, what you can do. There's a man called Jesus who can give you eternal life. And if you'll put your faith and trust in him, you can go to heaven. And that can give you assurance. Otherwise, you've got no hope whatsoever. And I said, better to get to the end of the road and say, well, I've made a mistake and it didn't work, than to get to the end of the road and say, well, I've got nothing to depend on. And I said, that's the way. Trust the Lord Jesus. He'll see you through a lovely opportunity to share with him. Now, that wouldn't have happened, eh? If I had my way. You see how, how human we are? We're all human beings and we fail. And sometimes God's got his own plan. And I bet God has been good to me and given me amazing opportunities uh, on a plane to witness and lead a person to the Lord or at least to sh- sow the seed because someone else reap, you know, can reap the benefit. I have a twin brother, I told you. He's an evangelist. He's preaching a crusade in South Africa. End of the crusade, a man comes forward. He said, I've come to get saved. He said, well, that's good. Why do you want to be saved? He said, because you witnessed to me. He said, when did I witness? He said, on the plane coming out from Frankfurt the other night. You sat next to me. We said, no, I never. Yeah, you sat next to me. <laughs> he said, no, it must have been my twin brother. <laughs> he said, whatever it was, you, he, he, he told me I must be saved. When I saw your picture, I said, I'm coming to be saved. I said, yeah, young I did all the hard work on the plane and you got all the glory as a result of that. <laughs> What's that? One sows, another reaps. It's God who gets the glory. That's all. And we're just called in our own circles to be a witness and a testimony. Okay, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for these dear ones that have listened so graciously. And I pray that upon this church, And these dear ones, the Spirit of God may descend. This is not a man's church. It belongs to you. This is your church. These dear people are your people. They love you. They could have gone to many places tonight. They chose to be here. And whatever has been said, Lord, what's not of yourself, remove it. But if something sticks... 
I pray that the Holy Spirit will indeed be the after speaker. And if you tarry, Lord, tomorrow, tomorrow night, Lord, at that time when we will share the gospel, and Sunday morning we pray for a visitation of the Holy Spirit in quickening power that we may give glory and praise and honor unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.